OK, so uh, we've already seen the problem that diacephalus, the Hensel twins, for example, Abigail and Brittany, which is one body, uh, two heads, uh, which are separately conscious, seems to pose for animalism. Because animalism says what we are is the organism, and there appears to be one organism, but there appear to be two people. So what does, animalist, what, what does an animalist say? The animalist uh, who really wants to bite the bullet with, uh, and who agrees that it is one organism would have to say, uh, and um, de Grazia says something like this, that there's two seats of consciousness in this one individual. But there's only one individual there because uh, there's only one organism. Now, instead of saying this, in the, because that just seems very counterintuitive in the case of uh, Abigail and Brittany Henson, uh, what he said, if you remember, is that there's two overlapping organisms. Um, so, and the way that, they, uh, that uh, other people backed him up on this is that they say that there's duplication of organs in there. So it is like two individuals have been mushed together because there's two, they could sort of, you could separate them and they could survive uh, independently. Now, I think myself that this is kind of dubious um, because possibility to survive independently, well then what do we say about something like a starfish? Because a starfish, you can, you can cut it into segments and then they will survive by themselves. Does that mean a starfish isn't one organism it's several because it could survive independently, that it's overlapping. I mean, once you start, start saying things like that, I, I wonder about, you know, the viability of your position. But anyway, um, in this article, uh, Tim Campbell and, and Jeff McMahon um, sort of try to nail animalism, uh, uh, you know, completely and not allow it to wiggle out by saying things like overlapping organisms. Um, to quote what they say about uh, what Campbell and McMahon say about Abigail and Brittany Hensel. Since animalists claim that we are identical to organisms, they are committed to the claim that where there is one of us, there is precisely one organism identical to this individual. Dicephalus, therefore, appears to be a counterexample to their theory. This is because each twin is a person and is related to the organism in the same way. Given the transitivity of the identity relation, both persons cannot be identical to the organism without being identical to each other. So if Abigail is identity to the, uh, identical to the organism uh, and Brittany is identical to the organism, then they would have to be equal to, identical to each other, and they're not. So because they're not, then neither one of them can lay claim to being identical with the organism. So for Brittany and Abigail, neither of them is identical to an organism. So animalism is not true for them. And if it's not true for them, it's not true for anybody, they would argue. Um, since they're not identical to each other, it seems that neither is identical to the organism. Thus, there are human persons that are not essentially organisms, and animalism is false. Um, now, uh, in response, animalists, as we've seen, bring up the problems for personalism, which is this view that uh, what we are is essentially persons. So personalism, of course, says there's two people there, because uh, there's two seats of consciousness. Um, now, what uh, the main problem with, uh, uh, or at least the one that Olson makes the most hay out of with personalism is the too many subjects problem. Um, personalism implies that we are not organisms, but then where you're sitting, there is also an organism that is a human being sitting. You're thinking, but how? Using your brain, but the organism has the same brain. So if your brain can think, then the organism's brain can think. It's thinking too. We have too many thinkers. Um, 
we saw that Baker tried to solve this, but Olson came up with the epistemic problem uh, as well. Suppose you think I have psych psychological identity conditions. Is that the organism having a false thought or the person having a true one? You can't tell. So this is animalism's response. Now, McMahon, as we've seen in his book that we read, early, uh, we read excerpts from earlier, has the embodied mind theory, and he says that we are part of an organism. So he says, uh, we're not organisms, we're part of organisms, partic uh, in particular the thinking parts, specifically the areas of the brain that are necessary and jointly sufficient for the capacity for consciousness. Uh, we are essentially thinking, so if that part of the brain ceases to function, then we're gone. The brain is still there, but we, we're, um, we, we've gone. So uh, now, how does this respond to the too many thinkers uh, problem? Well, it says that I am not identical with an organism. That's part of the problem with the, with the personalism view. Personalism says, this is me and it's a person. Uh, but it's also an organism. Whereas what my man, uh, and presumably Campbell as well, are saying is that I'm not all of this, I'm just the brain. Now, this, ha this in itself has strange implications. So if somebody asks uh, Jeff McMahon, how much do you weigh? If he's careful, he should say about three pounds, which is the average weight of the human brain, because that's what he is. Um, and if you say, are you thinking? Well, he would say yes, because it's the brain, but is this thinking? And he says, well, you can say that this is thinking, but it's not two different thinkers, because what, how this thinks is by using the brain. And he gives the analogy of, you can say, my car honked uh, in traffic. And that's a perfectly acceptable way of talking, but really what happened was that the horn of the car honked. So it's the part, a part of the car does the honking, but you can talk as if the whole thing does. So um, it's actually a part of you that does the thinking, but you can talk as if the organism does. But there's, uh, the organism without that is incapable of thinking. It, it, it obviously can't do it. Now, um, there, as we saw with the... Um, there's a corpse problem for animalism, which is if... Uh, because animalism says we are essentially alive. So if we die, then we cease to exist, according to animalism. So where did this thing that it now exists where we were, this corpse, where did that come from? What kind of thing is it? Where was it before? Was it, didn't it exist uh, five minutes earlier? Didn't this object exist five minutes earlier? What was that? I mean, if that's not the corpse, what is it? And Olson's first response, uh, he gives a second one, that, that, uh, a later one that they don't like, that they discuss in here, but his first response is to say that the corpse is an entirely new object made of the stuff that you were made of, but the corpse didn't exist until now. So yes, it does come into existence. It didn't exist because uh, it's only a problem if it existed at the same time as you, that there are two things in one space. But if it came into existence, it's okay for it to come into existence when you cease to exist. It's like a caterpillar and a butterfly. You know, they can't exist at one and the same time, but there definitely are caterpillars and there definitely are uh, butterflies. And when one ends, uh, another one begins. Of course, there's the chrysalis. Do you know that in the chrysalis, the, uh, the, butterfly, the caterpillar literally becomes liquid? So it's like a little soup in there as it's all rearranging. That's amazing. Um, now, so animalism had the corpse problem. Uh, the embodied mind theory of McMahon has a related problem, which is the functional brain problem. Uh, the bra so when my brain is functional, it's thinking. When it ceases to think, then I've gone, because I'm essentially uh, a thinking brain. So if, if my brain stops working, I've gone. Well, where does this chunk of gray matter that exists here, non-functioning, where does that come from? And he says, well, I'm going to use the same excuse that animalism uses to deal with the corpse problem. The response we favor to this objection parallels Olson's 
initial response in defense of animalism. Just as Olson claims that organisms and bodies do not coexist, but the matter that composes an organism comes to compose a body, a corpse, when the organism dies, so we suggest that functional brains and mere brains are never temporally or spatially coincident. That is, they don't exist in the same time and place. They exist in the same place, but not at the same time. Like the second my brain ceases to think, then it's no longer a functional brain and the mere brain comes into existence. Uh, on this view, the functional brain is not a mere brain in a functional state. It is one substance with a certain set of identity conditions, and the mere brain is a different subject, substance with a different set of identity conditions that do not include the capacity for consciousness. Okay, so that's, uh, that's McMahon's view, and he's going to argue that it has fewer problems than animalism. Okay. So we've seen that the animalist response to this is to say, well, yes, if we said that there was one organism there, then we'd be in trouble because uh, obviously there's two people and neither of them, so neither of them can be identical to the one organism. So therefore, there are at least two people who are not essentially animalism and if that's possible, animals, and if that's possible, animalism is false. So they can't really, uh, if they said this was one organism, which it really appears to be, uh, then uh, animalism is false. So the way they kind of sneak out of it is they say, well, it's two overlapping organisms. So each of them is, because you can say, well, there's uh, duplicates of certain things, like there's duplicate stomachs. So, um, you know, uh, Brittany is identical with this part of the organism and a Abigail is is uh, identical with this other part, so really there's two of them. Okay, let's look at some weirder, even weirder cases. Uh, sorry, that's a bit ableist, but when I say weird, I at least unusual and unknown to most of us, put it that way. For example, I'd never heard of this, Craniopagus parasiticus. Uh, as you can see from my amazing drawing, what it is, is a complete uh, regular human being with a, a, another head upside down. So it's, you, you've seen probably cases of um, conjoined twins where they're just joined at the skull. Joined at the skull. Sometimes they, have, they, they share the same brain. An amazing case, actually, is twins whose brains are fused and they can read each other's thoughts. They can ri literally have each other's thoughts. There are cases like that. So the human, uh, human Humans are weird, put it that way. Human, the, there's a huge variety of human experience. Um, but back to this case. So both of them are living and conscious. Now clearly, this one, this one didn't develop fully because we've had, if, if you've got a body upside down, you would have one of these cases of the fused head conjoined twins. But this one doesn't have a body. But it is conscious. Now, how does it stay alive? It has to be that it is fed by blood vessels that are serviced by the heart uh, and, you know, oxygenated by the lungs of this body down here. So, again, it looks like, looks like Dicephalus. So, again, it appears to present the same problem. If we have two persons, because they, they are both capable of, of separate consciousness, uh, but one organism, then animalism is false because neither of them can be identical with the organism. So what animalists say in response to this is that actually there's two organisms again. Um, animalists have to say that we have two organisms because uh, you can, this one could exist independently. Now, again, this seems a bit weird because actually this one can't survive without the blood. It has to be kept alive with artificial respirators, which I've illustrated with these boxes over here. Um, so that's a little weird, but that's certainly what, for example, Olson has said about this case. There's two organisms there. So that's how animalism wiggles out of the, the problem of saying that there's two persons, one organism. They say two persons, two organisms. Each of them is identical to the organism. This one 
Below here is one organism and one consciousness. Above here is another organism and another consciousness. Fine, if you're going to say that, says Olson, that will commit you to other things with these other cases that he mentions that are it's themselves going to be a problem for animalism. Okay, uh, then he asks us to imagine this. Imagine that just as with this case you can sever the head and it will be a separate organism, well imagine here instead of being in this situation you've only got one head, but you sever the head and you attach both the head and the headless body to respirators so they are kept alive. So they're both alive, this one remains conscious, this one remains alive. What do we say now? We have six possibilities, I'm going to ignore the, the second two, the, the last two because they're a little bit weird and, and I don't think anybody thinks that. Uh, so let's look at the four main possibilities. So, we started with one organism, then we did this, we, we severed the head and we kept the two parts alive. What do we say about the head and the body now? One thing we can say is that the head is the original organism and the body is not an organism. Because uh, otherwise we would have to say, um, well, there are problems with all of the views, but suppose we take the first approach. Now, that certainly seems the most consistent with this one, because uh, it seems to claim that the head can be an organism by itself. So if you're going to say in this case that there are two organisms because the severed head can be an organism by itself, then you would have to say that this severed head is an organism by itself. And presumably if it's an organism, it has to be the original because there's only one organism to start out with. So if there's only one organism to start out with, then it, let, let it be the head. So the, so the first one seems to be most consistent with this. The problem with it is it, it also includes the claim that the body is not an organism. Now, why would the body not be an organism? Because, um, because uh, the head would be in charge of the body and the body presumably could not survive without the regulating capacity of the body, particularly the brainstem. Uh, the reason why animalists are okay with saying that this separate head is an organism is because it contains a brainstem and the brainstem is the part of your brain that regulates things. For example, people can be entirely uh, missing their cerebellum and can stay alive. Uh, anencephalic babies. Some babies are born without their cerebella, uh, and it's called anencephaly, which means missing brain. And uh, they can breathe, they can remain alive. They, some of them don't even need respirators because they've got the brain stem, and the brain stem uh, can regulate activity. So that's part of the reason why uh, animalists can claim that a brain can be an organism. Um, now, uh, so that seems to suggest that if the brain is the organism, then once you remove that from here, what's left can't be the organism. But consider the Schumann case. In, um, this was a case uh, where a boy had, had lost all his, uh, had lost all of his brain. He was totally brain, including the brain stem. And the mother took the boy home and kept, kept the body alive. What this case shows is that even in the absence of any brain at all, a human body can remain comprehensively functional for years with no external life support, uh, no more external life support than that required by many fully conscious, conscious and uncontroversially living human beings. So the Schumann case appears to show that that can't be true. So that seems to rule out um, rule out option number one. And in fact, in contrast, a living but isolated head has no internal regulation or integration even of a de uh, decentralized sort. So just as Schumann's case shows that the brain stem is not an essential regulatory core of a human organism, so it also shows that an animalist reason for denying that a headless but ventilated body is an organism is inadequate. So it looks like we've ruled out option number one. 
Um, okay, what about number two, which says fission, that we've got um, the, uh, we've got two organisms. Well, one problem is, is this is that we've already shown that the head is not an organism um, because the Schumann case shows that uh, without the brain, something can have survived. So that appears to show that the headless body is an organism. Um, but another problem, he says, well, uh, what Campbell and McMahon say, what, imagine if we reunited them, but uh, we reunited them so that the head could control the body, but we don't reunite the blood and circulation system. So in other words, the head is controlling the body, but what's keeping the head alive is an outside respirator. And without this, the head will die. Similarly for the, uh, the body, and out, the outside thing will survive. And instead of fusion, we have what he calls conjunction. You're joined neurolog neurologically, but not circulatorily. Then the animalist would have to say that there are two organisms because what's keeping this alive is this, what's keeping this alive is this. Because if, if when you said when they're separate, separate, there are two organisms, which is what option two says, well, if what's keeping this alive is still doing it when you conjoin them, uh, then you have to say there are still two organisms. But of course, if you ask this person who can control his body, he will say, no, that's just one of me. Um, so he's going to disagree with that account. So we'll rule that out. All right, uh, skip over number three and look at number four. Uh, well, if the... Um, uh, this one says that neither is an organism. But again, Schumann's case seems to rule that out because it seems to show that a body without a brain can be an organism. So it seems to, this one implies, because this one includes the claim that the body is not an organism, Schumann's case rules that out. So what does that lead? Leave. The body is the original. So, um, as, uh, as McMahon and Campbell say on page 297, we believe option three is correct. That is, we believe that the original person would be a part of the living head, which would not be an organism, while the original organism would survive as the headless body. Uh, if this is right, we are potentially separable in this way from our animal organisms, and so cannot be identical with them animalism is false. That is, uh, once you separate the two, the head, we would say, uh, this is us, and we are the head, whereas the animalist would have to say, no, this is you, it's the body. So this is like the cerebral uh, transplant case, which is a problem for animalism. If you transplant the cerebrum to someone else, it looks like the animalists have to say the body that remains is you and uh, where the cerebrum goes, well, that's just somebody else who thinks they're you. Well, further argument is provided by this case, cephalopagus. Now notice where here we have two separate heads, two consciousnesses. Here we have a single head but two totally distinct bodies. That is, nothing in this body controls this, nothing in this body controls this, but the same brain controls both of them. There's two separate spinal columns, uh, so this brain can send signals independently to this one and this one. So one head and two bodies. What are the options for the animalists? They can accept that because there would be only one cerebrum, there would be only one mind, and thus only one person or one of us. That would oblige them to say that there would be only one organism. So let's say the animalists say one person, one organism that is identical to the person. But that is impossible to reconcile with their first and more plausible option in the case of Dicephalus. Because in the case of Dicephalus, namely that there are two overlapping organisms. So if they're saying in Dicephalus there are two overlapping organisms, 
Um, that's because there are organs that operate separately uh, of each of the twins. Like um, they have Seth, uh, Brittany and Abigail have different stomachs. But there are two different stomachs here. So if you're, if you're prepared to say that there are two organisms here, you have exactly the same reason to say that there are two organisms here. It is simply impossible to maintain that Dicephalus is two organisms, while Cephalopagus is only one. If, therefore, they accept that there is only one person and thus only one organism in Cephalopagus, they must accept that there can be only one organism and thus only one person in Dicephalus. It is, however, very difficult to believe that the Hensel twins are only one person. Suppose that instead they say there, there are two organisms in Cephalophagus. That entails that there are also therefore two of us, even though there's only one consciousness. What if they say that there's two of us, but only one of them is a person? Because after all, uh, animalists are perfectly okay with saying there's one of us, it's not a person yet, as in the case of a fetus or as someone in PVS. Um, but both of these have equal claim to be the person. If you're going to say that there's two organisms but only one is the person, which one do you pick? If you pick this one uh, to be the person, why isn't this a person? It's got exactly the same claim. Um, this leaves animalism with yet another form of the too many subjects problem. For every thought generated by a single cerebrum, animalists must claim that there are two thinkers because both of them have equal claim. And this is worse than the problem for personalists because the two thinkers are of the same kind. Remember the too many subjects problem for personalism says that the person and the animal are both thinkers, whereas here you have two animals. It seems, therefore, that neither organism is identical with the person. In our hypothetical case of Cephalopagus, there are three distinct or non-identical individuals. An individual of our kind, a person, who is, we are supposing, identical with the consciousness generating areas of the functional cerebrum, and two human organisms. If this is the correct description, animalism is false because you can't have the person be identical with the organism. That's their argument.